I'm Mark, and this is The Country Life with Columbus Mark, where I try to bring you a lighthearted look at life in the country. I used to want to be a magician, but it never worked out. You're seeing my trick right now. That's as good as it gets. But in this video, you're going to meet Glenn Strange, a comedian magician from the upstate of South Carolina. He is a professional. So, Glenn, I want to thank you for being on my show. Well, thank you. Okay. And I'm excited because I've never had a comedian or a magician on my videos, and definitely not the combination of the two. Okay. Actually, I had someone in a, in a podcast who was a comedian, but that's another story. So, in your, on your tagline, maybe on your website, it says, Comedy, Magic, Inspiration. Are they in that order? Uh. Yeah, well, the comedy's all throughout the, the program. It's basically a magic show with audience interaction, and the comedy is built around what happens during the show, and it usually ends on an inspirational message or something like that, based on the importance of laughter in every, everyday life. And uh, so it's kind of a fast-paced comedy show and then all of a sudden it gets serious right in the last few minutes so I found that's a, a good combination and you've been doing this how long well I quit counting at 25 years because it made me feel old so <laughs> but it's a long time so. so let me ask you growing up were you the class clown no I was uh, extremely shy really shy in fact uh, parents and teachers thought I never would make it out of school, but uh, but I, inside I wanted to, to do something and I wanted to be funny. And that's one reason I guess I turned to comedy is, is I felt comfortable if, if I could make people laugh. So I began to come out of my shell around the 10th grade and, and enjoy making people laugh. And uh, So did you start doing magic and comedy in 10th grade? No, I, yeah, I was... I was an adult with children when that happened. A friend of mine, Danny Scott, that I worked with, his grandfather had taught him magic and I'd worked with him for two or three years and one day at lunch he was doing card tricks and I said, I need to learn that. So he was kind enough to share some of his information with me and tell me how to go about getting started because when I was a child, I wanted to do magic, but I'd go to the library and all the library books under the magic section were science books. And I said, I don't want to do science projects. I want to do magic. And, but uh, he helped me out. And I had another friend, Tom Kale, who always encouraged me to be a magician even before I knew I wanted to be a magician. So, so how did you come up with the idea of, I mean, I've seen plenty of magicians on TV. Some of them are very serious. How did you decide to be a comedian in addition to a magician? Well, it took about three years. Once I was introduced to magic, I was doing everything from producing flowers, trying to be serious, and I had done a few shows, and I found out that the people seemed to enjoy the laughter. And, and magic is one of those entertainment things that uh, you have to add something to it to make it entertaining. If you watch David Copperfield, he usually has the big illusions and he has the dancers and he has great music. All that combined with the magic makes it a great show. So uh, it took about three years and I was at a magic convention and saw a magician there who used comedy and I said, that's what I need to do. Uh, so it wasn't until I saw somebody else do it that I figured that was the direction I needed to go in and stop wasting my time doing all these fancy magic tricks and things like that. Do you remember your very first trick? Uh, my first trick, my friend Tom Kell bought it at uh, Disney World and brought it home to me. And uh, But I don't remember my first one. Once I found out where there was a local magic shop at that time in Greenville, uh, a friend of mine, Danny, was going over there one day and I gave him $20 and I said, bring me back some tricks. So he brought back five simple tricks. Well, it didn't take but about 48 hours to me for me to become a magician. I was on the phone ordering business cards, even though I really didn't even have a show. I just knew I enjoyed it and it was something I could do. So what was your very first paid gig? Or, or free gig, I guess. Yeah. Well, the first paid one, and they were, I charged them $25 and they were overcharged. <laughs> Let's put it that way. 
and uh, it was for a friend's his child's birthday party and I knew it was going to be a week show so my wife at the time was into baking cake so I baked the cake I gave the kid a present so I spent way more than $25 to go do the show so I wouldn't feel guilty and I found out right there you don't do card tricks for eight-year-old little girls they don't know what card is which card and if you pass it out, it'll come back wadded up in a piece of paper and it uh, kind of takes away from the little show. That's when I discovered a uh, magician in Atlanta, David Ginn, who specialized in kids magic and, and started reading and studying how to, how to control kids. I call it control chaos. And, and uh, just those books and things really helped me grow. But it was that first show that, that uh, I knew right away I wasn't a magician <laughs> and I shouldn't be charging, so. But you worked your way up. Yeah. Because I've seen your list of places you've performed. Right. So I went and I started out doing kids shows, then a lot of civic clubs and, and uh, Ruatans and things like that. And then uh, church groups, they enjoy working for churches and then find out about the corporate world that they have annual meetings where they need entertainment if they go to Hilton Head or Grove Park Inn or something like that. They usually have entertainment or some kind of a relaxed atmosphere in the beginning of their convention or at the end, close it out, close their convention out. So that was a market that I also went into. So are you your, your own agent, I take it? I have several agents that uh, represent me. They don't represent solely me, they represent entertainers. And uh, they, they are really good. Uh, COVID kind of wiped a lot of them out because the entertainment business went south during COVID. And so some of them were, were at retirement age, so they just decided not to start back into the business. But uh, I do have agents and I book directly too, so either way. Have you ever had a performance other than that eight-year-old girl's birthday party that you thought bombed? Uh, I'm, if I did, I wiped them out. Well, yeah, I did. I, I had one that was terrible. <laughs> I don't like to do outside shows, but a friend of mine had booked an outside show and his wife was really sick and he called me and says, I'm not going to be able to get away to do the show. Will you go do it for me? And it was up in Hendersonville, North Carolina. It was what they call Farm Day Festival. And I said, sure, I'll go do it for you. So I get up there and he said it was on the ball field. Well, there was five ball fields and actually it was the fifth one I went to. It had rained the whole night before, terribly rained, so the ground was still wet. And it was a ball field behind me. But it was one thing after another that I couldn't control. The wind was blowing like it usually does after a big rain. The wind was blowing, no joke, 30, 35 miles an hour. Oh, and they put me under a, I call it a funeral tent, one of those tents that you go and get under when you're about to uh, do the burial process. So I died under that funeral tent that day. And, uh, but what I didn't know was they had a grease pig competition. Because people kept coming by and saying, where's the grease pig competition? I said, I don't know anything about it. Well, as it turned out, it was right behind me in the ball field. And the ball field was fenced in. So they turned the greased pigs loose. They brought in all these kids and they chased the pig. Well, the, the, the PETA people there were protesting the pigs. And so they had a pickup truck they were all sitting in. There was also a tractor pull going on behind me and they started the tractor pull the same time <laughs> I started my show, which was loud fuel blown engines like you'd see in a dragster. So I had to compete against that. And everything was going fine with the PETA people till a part of my show where I give a, a little plastic pig away to a child for helping me do a trick. And when I mentioned pig, they remembered why they were there. So they started raising their <laughs> posters up, shouting and all that. The police came over there to ask, and I heard the police say, would you please wait till the magic show's over? People are watching the show. Well, they got all upset and they almost went into a fight, but... Uh, it turned out to, and the wind blew the edge of the tent loose and it was flopping and props were blowing away because the wind was... So that was my greatest disaster. But, uh, Did you ever talk to your friend again? Oh yeah, oh, he managed to get away just long enough to come watch the show and he was laughing so hard 
and that uh, he had a camera and I said, did you take any pictures? Because nobody's going to believe this. And he said, no, I was laughing too hard. So. Well, that's probably, people <laughs> probably thought it was all part of the shit. I guess, but it was a disaster. But uh, Well, can you, can you make a real living doing what you're doing? Yes, it, it's tough. You turn into, <clears throat> you should say, a marketing and business person. Uh, you spend more time marketing than you do doing the shows. It takes... You know, it could take a year to, to from the beginning to you start talking with a client to, to get the, the program. And uh, uh, a lot of times they book them in advance, a year in advance, too. So that's just standard procedure, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and marketing has changed over the years. When I first started, you would send out packages in the mail, videotapes and all this, because they wouldn't book you unless they'd seen the actors how to videotape. But now everything's done online. You just send them to your website and things like that. So it's actually easier. So yeah, I bet I bet so. Well, if any kids are watching this video and they say, "Boy, I would love to do that," any advice you could give them? Uh, well, it depends on their age. You know, let's say uh, just figure out which direct, because there's all types of magic. There's close-up, there's stage, there's comedy, there's serious. Just figure out which avenue you want to go down. And that usually takes at least three to five years of trying everything till you find that niche that fits you in your personality. And then if they're still young and if they want to go to college, encourage them to go to college and take business courses and things like that, if they want to pursue magic as a career. Uh, because that's the hard part is the business end of the magic it's, and some people are gifted in that and some people have to work really hard and it doesn't hurt to have training to do that is there one trick in your mind that stands out as your favorite gosh i have all of them are my favorite that i do uh, uh, i enjoy the, i want my first goal is to make people laugh even, no matter what the trick is so my goal is not to fool people, not to make them feel dumb because they don't know how the trick is done. I just want them to laugh and be entertained. And so sometimes the trick is actually the second part. The first goal is to make them laugh. And uh, that's what I enjoy. I guess the, the best the one that fits all of that is a trick that I do where I borrow a hundred dollar bill and it looks like I destroy it and make it come back. That's about a six minute routine, and uh, it has a lot of laughter in it. And a lot of comedy that I do is based off interaction and what the person says to me when I ask them a question. And uh, because I've done it so many times, just about any answer they give me, I've heard before, so I have a comedy answer back. But like I say, it's not to make them feel bad or anything or make fun of them. A lot of comedians abuse their audience, but I work really hard not to abuse the audience. Good for you. Good for you. So, do you have one trick for me to help me get more subscribers to my YouTube channel? Because <laughs> I need the something. Business course. You're There's the business to. course. Okay. Uh, well, Glenn, anything else you want to add? No, I just, you know, I think. Uh, Magic is a great hobby if people want to do it as a hobby or if they want to do it as a profession. Uh, and it's a great in that you can spend five dollars and you can do you can make people be entertained just as well as you can a fifty thousand dollar trick or illusion. And it's it's all in the presentation and connecting with the audience more so than the trickery of it. But uh, I guess, you know, I could talk for hours about things like that, but we don't have hours. So. No. <laughs> Do you plan to, to keep this up for a while? Yeah. You know, I heard a, a performer say one time, performers never retire. People just quit calling. So people are still calling. So until they stop calling, then, then I'll retire. When they do that, I'll retire. So. Well, Glenn, thanks so much. Well, it's been fun. You. Can't wait to see your show live one day. Okay. Now what I want you gentlemen to do is reach back and take out your bill folder money clip. Take out your bill folder money clip. Open that up and remove a $100 bill. <laughs> one's not looking, one's talking to his wife. 
Do you have a hundred dollar bill, sir? You do not. And you're proud of it too, aren't you? <laughs> How about you, sir? Do you have a hundred dollar bill? Spent your money on your clothes, didn't you? <laughs> How about you, sir? Do you have a hundred dollar bill? Hmm. You, sir, in the red sweater, you got a hundred dollar bill? Yes, you. You do have a hundred? Because I can't see with the light. You men sit down, I found a sucker. Bring the money and come on down. He's excited. Thank you so much for volunteering. Okay, well, thank you so much. Just keep the money out. I'll tell you. No, 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 no. Hey, let's get your money out. Let's take your bill full out. Yeah, that's a nice shirt. Yeah, it's got little doggies all over it, doesn't it? Yeah. Or is that reindeer? Ooh, that's a, Yeah, put your bill full up. You won't need that. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your name? I'm Mark. Mark. Oh, that's a great name. That's my granddaddy on my mama's side, Mark. <laughs> Papa Mark. Now, Mark, I could read off that big old long serial number. There's probably 10 or 11 numbers, and nobody would remember it. But they will remember three numbers. I'm going to read off the last three numbers. You verify that I'm telling the truth. There's a 2, a 3, a 0. Then there's a letter C. Now, that's easy to remember because 2 is half a 4, and everybody knows what half a 4 is. The next number is 3, and that's half a 6. Everybody knows what half a 6 is. And 0 is nothing. We all start with nothing. And C stands for candy. Everybody likes no lights candy. So that's two, three, zero, C. Hold the money. In my pocket, I have a felt tip pen. Amen. I know I felt it. <laughs> it's not a good joke, but I like it. <laughs> I can't find it. I got this one down at the post office. They gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're free down there this oh, time of year. Yeah. Now, oh, I got this one at the bank. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, let me tell you how to do it. Now, now don't go to the drive-thru because that doesn't work good. And, uh, but go inside when you do your banking. Just make mild. The key to any good banking is mild chit-chat. You just make mild chit-chat, and you talk about the uh, weather, your grandkids, kids, hers or his or whatever. You know, just make mild chit-chat. And when you leave, don't put it down. You'll feel a slight tug. You just jerk it, and it'll come right off. <laughs> you can get them right there. So that you'll be able to identify that $100 bill if you ever see, I mean, when you see it again. I want you to put your initials or some kind of identifying mark anywhere on that $100 bill. That way you'll know it. You may have to lick it. Is it writing? No. It's not. No, you stole a bad pen. Uh, it's just my luck. Okay, there you go. Or it could be a bad $100 bill. You don't know. <laughs> Let's see. There it is. Got your initials. The number is zero is two three zero C. I'll double your money. Ba da <laughs> Another bad joke. And I'll fold it again and again. Over here I have four envelopes, three of which are stuck down. One is stuck up. I'm going to place your $100 bill in this stuck-up envelope. While I'm doing that, you may inspect these three stuck-down envelopes. You can hold them up to the lights. One at a time, you will see there's a piece of paper. It's actually a small piece of play money cut in the same shape as your $100 bill. Hold them up. Check it out. This is in there to confuse you, which two people said was not hard to do. <laughs> Got them inspected? You're quick. Yours is in the one on the bottom. If I take from the bottom, place it on top, it's on top. If I take this one, place it up there, it's second from top. Loosen up, it's just money. <laughs> you look like a bird dog on the first day of hunting season. You're starting to quiver and go up on one foot. Now, it's pretty easy to keep up with, but so that you or I or nobody that's in this room knows exactly which envelope contains your money, I want you to take all four envelopes, put them behind your back, and you'd be the one that mixes them up. In my pocket, I have a felt-tip pen. I know I felt it. There it is. Mixed up? I will number these from one to a hundred. But I'll stop at four. <laughs> number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. You have a free choice. You may have envelope one, two, three, or four. The choice is yours. 
Would you like to phone a friend? <laughs> Which one? Three. Three. Ah. Odds are in your favor. You're a lucky man. Place number three out of sight in your pocket. Wait right here. This is what we find out what kind of sense of humor you have. (laughs) (laughs) You pick number three. I did pick number three. We will start with number one. Oh, no. (laughs) But... I couldn't do this in this beautiful theater. What would happen if that flame were to get out of control? I wouldn't get to finish the show. But I got this handy dandy portable shredder. This will work just as good. Would you like to trade envelopes? Ah, born leader, a man that's not afraid to make a decision. That's the mark of a born leader. We need more leaders in this world today. Moving right along. (laughs) Envelope number two. Would you like to trade envelopes? No. (sighs) A born leader. A man that's not afraid to make a decision. That's the mark of a leader. We need more leaders in this world today. Now, I see a little green tent. (laughs) I'm not not at all worried about that. (laughs) Because it's not my money. Last chance, envelope number four. What's behind the curtain? I'm going to stay with three. He's staying with three. Mm-hmm. He's sticking with even when he's not. He's going with that gut feeling. That's the mark of a leader. Initial gut feeling. Most leaders die broke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Let's go over what happened. I asked five or six men to stand up. I asked to borrow a large bill. You were kind enough to let us borrow a hundred dollar bill. We verified the last three serial numbers. It was a two, three, zero C. Just in case we forgot those numbers, you put an identifying mark on there, making it totally different than any other one hundred dollar bill in the entire world. Mm-hmm. For the grand finale, you had a free choice. For the grand finale, they see the envelope that you picked that you just you decided not to change your mind. Most people do, but you decided not to. Number three. Cup your hands together, read off the last three serial numbers, verify that that's your initials, and, (laughs) oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Back to magic school we go. I hate it. (laughs) I hate it. Have you got another one? I think I know what you did wrong. Press out. I'm fresh out. I'm fresh out. <laughs> you you live in this immediate area? Yeah, I do. You do? <laughs> I don't. That's good. <laughs> now, uh, now, now I want you to take these with you. <laughs> it's the least I can do. Take these with you and take them down to the bank where you bank. <laughs> Now, the key is you be there on a Monday morning. Pick a Monday morning because they don't make appointments on Monday, but if you show up, they'll see you. You be sitting in the parking lot before they open up. And when you see the bank president drive in, you get out of your vehicle and walk in with the bank president. You want to go straight to the top. (laughs) You just make the key to any good banking is mild chit-chat. You just make mild chit-chat. Talk about the weather, the kids, the grandkids, whatever. Go on in there and shut the door gently in the office. Explain to them what happened. (laughs) You went out and saw this great show. There was some music, wonderful music, and had a magician there. It wasn't any good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you let him have a $100 bill, and he's ready to be totally down. You hand this to the bank president, and he'll tell you what you can do with them. <laughs> <coughs> but I'm insured. I have an insurance policy. It's in my billfold, my genuine cowhide leather zippered billfold. Smell it? Yep, that sure is. Mm-hmm. In this zippered billfold... In a sealed envelope, what does that say? Shred insurance. Shred insurance. It's shredded on the, it's, it's sealed on the back in the standard fashion. Plus, it has three red seals. Sealed. <laughs> but in this envelope, cup your hands together. Read off the last three serial numbers. 
Is that, is that your mark? And that is my mark. Well, look excited, okay? Yeah. All right, give him a big hand. Thank you, son. Thank you. I'm Mark. This is The Country Life with Columbus Mark. Thanks for watching. I hope you'll subscribe, share, like, comment, and come back often.